pleasure to see you all here, because I'm going to talk about one of my favorite people, John Quincy Adams. Oh, okay. yeah. Right. yeah. So, uh, can I walk around with this? Yeah, I can. Okay. So, 1767, that's when he was born. And he died in 1848. And the reason I write this up is that um, this is an extremely important part of uh, American history. And John Quincy Adams is uh, not at all celebrated in the United States for, I mean, Lincoln is famous, Roosevelt is famous, and most people know the name John Quincy Adams. But he is one of the greatest, if not the greatest American I have gotten to know. Apart from, you know, Benjamin Franklin was yes, great, George Washington was great, Lincoln was great, FDR was great, but uh, I can prove to you through today, and I'm going to give a second class to maybe a third, but at least two, because his life was so rich, that if it was not for John Quincy Adams, Lincoln could never have succeeded. The United States would not succeed today. And the United States would not be a continental nation from uh, sea to shining sea. It, it wouldn't be like the way, it, that was all John Quincy Adams. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm going to show that. Um, and um, I mean, one of the things that I think is so important in this crisis we are in, and everybody's here, know that we have a grave crisis with the financial collapse, the danger of war, and moral, cultural uh, destruction. So uh, one of the things that are really key in such a period is to, to find and get to flourish and water uh, the key ideas that uh, uh, created this nation how these ideas was fought for, because that is the culture of the United States. The real America is the, uh, the principles as embedded in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And maybe as a, most people here are, maybe you were born in America, but I was not. And so people take for granted, oh yeah, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, so what else is new? But it took me 10, 15 years here in America to understand, I couldn't understand what kept this nation together. Because I come from Denmark, all the Danes look the same, more or less, skinnier and fatter and taller and shorter, but they look the same, they talk, the, they speak the same language, they share a shared history through thousand years. They are all, 98% of them are Protestant. Uh, they very important, they have, we have hundreds of songs that everybody knows about the history, old love affairs and the springtime in Denmark and winter and so on. And uh, very, very important, we all eat the same food. And the food has to be eaten in a very specific way. And if we go to Japan, I sometimes have had people in Denmark saying to me, where I say, you can't eat the food like that, and they would say, why not? And if you go to Japan, the Japanese will have the same thing, Japanese songs, Japanese food that has to be eaten in a specific way, and Japanese language. And when you grow up in another country than America, you think, well, that is what constitutes your nation. And that is, we all look the same, we speak the same, we eat the same food, and we have the same history. In the United States, you go into New York City, you go up Fifth Avenue, and... Uh, there's all these kind of different foods, people look different, they speak differently, they come from different backgrounds, and what holds this nation together? The key thing that holds this nation together are the ideas in the Declaration of Independence that we hold these truths to be self-evident, like it's self-evident, it's so clear that you can kind of see them, uh, that all men are created equal with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But when something is inalienable, it's inherent, you cannot, it cannot be taken away from you. And uh, those principles, I think the two key things in the preamble that uh, uh, build upon uh, the preamble of the Constitution, that build upon the Declaration of Independence, of these six points in the preamble, 
I think the most two important ones are the general welfare and posterity. So, but with, if, you, if you think about the inalienable rights of man and the general welfare and posterity, those principles go for the whole world, whether you're Japanese, Danish, from Sudan. They, they are principles that are universal and uh, get, are for every single person in the world. And when I figured that out, that was like a revelation because that is, this is what keeps this nation together. And this is what we're about to lose. And that's also why it is so important to celebrate and uh, get to know more a great man than John Quincy Adams. And that's what I'm going to try to do today and then in another class because his life was so rich and he dedicated his entire, entire adult life um, actually also when he was a child, <laughs> uh, to the United States. He was in public service from he was um, 26 till he died uh, with no break. He literally died uh, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, he had a stroke the 21st of February and he died in U.S. Congress two days later. So let me go, let me look at him. Uh, so what you have with, with John Quincy is that he lives the Declaration of Independence. He is the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And um, I will now go through and just show you some pictures too to just kind of get a little sniff of the surroundings and so on. Um, he, um, he is born in, 18, in um, 1767 in Massachusetts. And if you go to, or I'll make it bigger, uh, and if you go to, um, if you go to, if you go up to Boston, I will definitely recommend that you get a tour of the uh, Quincy House, John Quincy Adams Library and so forth. It's very exciting and you have some good guides up there. I did it myself two years ago when I was in Seventh Heaven. So here you have, it's like a sculpture of John Quincy Adams when he's seven years old and his mother Abigail. And I'll come to hear her in a second. Um, I, you have to see at that time, um, now we're talking about in 1772 in America. His father is not there most of the time. You have war taking place in the United States. It is the Revolutionary War. And his father is away most of the time because uh, he is uh, uh, part of writing the Declaration of Independence and later on he works on the Constitution, John Adams, uh, John Quincy Adams' father. And um, uh, I want to read a, see if I can do it here, from his, di one thing that is so great about him is his diary. I know I have to have light. Oh, I can just step over here. That'll be fine. We can just put on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when he is a little boy like that, what you have, you have Bunkers Hill, the battle at Bunkers Hill, where he describes at another place. I'm not going to read that. He describes how he, uh, his mother, and uh, him awakened awakened uh, at night by noises thunder noises and so forth, and that's the battle at Bunker Hill. And they grow up, you can, uh, they crawl up on a hill to see it from afar. You can do that too if you go to uh, Boston, you can visit where Abigail went up with her son when he was seven years old. So you have to kind of think about what shapes a child, what shapes a human being. And what he writes about this period, he writes in his diary, the year 1775 was the eighth year of my age. Among the first fruits of the war was the expulsion of my father's family from their peaceful abode in Boston to take refuge in his and my native town of Braintree. For the space of 12 months, my mother with her infant children dwelt liable every hour of the day and of the night to be butchered in cold blood or taken and carried into Boston as hostages by any foraging or marauding detachment of men. 
like that actors in force on the 19th of April to capture John Hancock and Samuel Adams on their way to attend the Continental Congress of, at Philadelphia. So that is, the, that is the surroundings when he is a young seven, eight, nine-year-old kid. It is war. The, fa the father is away in Philadelphia to uh, form the Declaration of Independence uh, and so forth. So uh, let me show you his father and mother. So you have Abigail and John Adams. And uh, Abigail is a real piece of work, and you will see that a little bit later. Um, I, my hypothesis, I might be wrong, I mean, John Adams was not a bad guy. I mean, he was very important in what he did. Uh, he was vice president under George Washington, and then he became president. And, uh, but I think the best job he did was uh, the basis he laid for his son, John Quincy Adams. Uh, my hypothesis is that one of the problems he had was he allowed John Quincy Adams uh, to have too much of his pants. I'm trying to be polite here since it's being taped. <laughs> that is, she had her balls very often. She, he didn't control himself. I mean, she was really a uh, very controlling woman. And to such an extent, well, I'll, I'll talk about her a little bit later. I need the light, Bob, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, the father uh, is very, that's what I said, one of the real good things about John Adams is what he does to John Quincy, who is the, his older son. So when, when uh, John Quincy is 10 years old, uh, he, he tells him, you have to study history of the Peloponnesian War. And it has to be in Greek, because that's the greatest of all languages. So if you can imagine, uh, you have often heard uh, LaRouche talk about the Peloponnesian War and the importance of the history of the Peloponnesian War. So John, John Adams has his son study, studying the Peloponnesian War and other history in Greek. Um, and then uh, when John Quincy Adams is 11 years old, and that is where anybody, this is the greatest thing about this man. You can really get to know how he thinks in his entire life. Because when he's 11, he begins to write a diary. And he continues for 68 years. <laughs> yeah, there's only a short break when he's Secretary of State because at that time, when you were Secretary of State, you didn't have a staff. John Quincy Adams did everything himself, so he had to read 40 newspapers per week and things like that. So there was a short period when he was Secretary of State where he didn't put entries in more or less every day. Uh, but for 68 years, so if you want to get a good idea about how this guy things and how his mind is, including the innermost feelings of him, uh, you can do that because you, you have his diary. Um, and I, this is one of the most pleasant things I ever did. I just took it from, he was 11 years old, and then I just started reading his diary, and that was like following him his entire life. So, um, and also when he's 11 years old, his father takes him to Europe. 11 years old, think about when children are being formed. Um, now he's beginning to close in and becoming a teenager. 11 years old, and he goes with his dad to Europe. Uh, think about also how the trip was at that time with the boat uh, and so on. And there he's rubbing shoulders with Benjamin Franklin and Jefferson and Lafayette. And he spends one year in Europe. Um, and often for months and months, he's together with Benjamin Franklin every night. If you can imagine an 11-year-old kid doing that. And uh, so after a year, he comes back to the United States. He's in the United States for three months. And off he goes again with his dad to Europe. He's now 14 years old. Um, and you see here that is, um, oh, let's just let it cover in here. You see here. No, no, no. No, no, I'm just going to go. Um, oops, there, here we go. Um, so that is him when he's 13, 14 years old. And he goes to the University of Leiden in Holland. And that's an interesting place, too, because that was the university where the people that came to Plymouth um, 
um, with the original people that came to the United States. They were from the surroundings and were supported by the University of Leiden, a very old university. And there he kind of goes when his, uh, his dad is there as uh, taking diplomatic, uh, diplomatic work in Holland and he sends his son to uh, Leiden University. And uh, there he is, um, L-E-Y-D-E-N, I think. Uh, and there he studies medicines, medicine, chemistry, philosophy, and then his dad has a special command to him. I want you to take notes about everything going on in this university because this is a famous university. I want you to, to seek out all the best at this university so that we can implement that at Harvard back in the United States. So, um, uh, so that is one, can you imagine that you give your 14 year old, not only the 14 year old supposed to study all these things, but he also uh, gave his 14 year old the uh, task to figure out what is the very best education wise that we can bring from a university in Europe to, um, to the United States, to Harvard in the United States. So he is not that long in Leiden because uh, he is asked, and again, 14. Think about how many 14 year olds you know and maybe think back about how you were when you were 14. Um, when he is, uh, yeah, when he's like 14 years old, he's being sent as a translator uh, to St. Petersburg in Russia with the gentleman at that time called Dana who represents the United States. So, yeah, so that's also, so, and see what is so special about him is that he gets to know the very best in Europe and he gets to know the very worst in Europe. <laughs> so he can take the very best and then when later on when they're trying the British, the Spanish, the French and so forth to manipulate the United States, and he is the Secretary of State and President and so forth. He knows exactly what they are up to because he learned uh, when he was a kid. So, uh, so he's in St. Petersburg for translating. And uh, when he's 16, he's told by his dad, you come back. But he takes a little time. He goes along. He, uh, instead of going the straight, uh, well, I don't have a map here, but instead of going straight from St. Petersburg into Europe, he goes the Nord Nordic route. Uh, through Finland, Sweden, down to through Denmark and so forth. He take, it takes him half a year and he has a great time. He is 16 years old and you can imagine at that time how you travel. At that, it's not exactly like the way we do it, but he just wants to see a little bit of, his wor of the world without being too controlled. And he's all alone, he's 16, and he travels for half a year from St. Petersburg and hooks, hooks up with Lafayette and Benjamin Franklin in Paris. That's so, and, and, he, and he, he says, he writes in his diary uh, several stories about uh, Lafayette because Lafayette likes to make fun of the oligarchy and so forth. So he, he has these comments in his diary. And then in 1785, he has now been five and a half years in Europe and he now knows Dutch fluently, Dutch, French, Greek, Latin, and Russian. And uh, he's 18 years old, I'll repeat, Dutch, French, Greek, Latin, and Russian. And later on, he'll become fluent in German too. But that's what he knows so far. And he's coming back to US because he now has to get an education because you have <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing. Stop fooling so, around. Uh, stop fooling around, yeah. So, uh, and he has to go to Harvard. And as he says, uh, he has to study law, and he says, God in heaven, if, the, if these are the only terms on which life can be granted to me, oh, take me from this world before I curse the day of my birth. <laughs> so that's what he thought about Howard and the education there. Harvard? Yeah. Uh, he, at this time too, I want to kind of give you also some personal stuff because um, He's not just like fantastic. He has his flaws and whatever. And he falls tremendously in love with a woman called Mary Frazier. And um, his mother, Abigail, stops it because 
he has no money. That is, John Quincy Adams has no money. And she's of a little bit of a better position, and he's supposed to take care of her. So the mother squashes it. And uh, it's quite something. There is two times in his diary, when he's in his 70s, where he writes about this old love, where he, um, by chance, he visits a cemetery, and he finds, so this Mary Fraser, his old love, uh, marries another person, and she gets a daughter, and that daughter is buried in that cemetery that he visits, and he starts crying. And he says, he's 71 years old, and at that time, at that time, this guy has been ambassador to five nations, state, secretary of state and president, and he's now in U.S. Congress. And he visits this cemetery, and he writes about his lo old love that the mother destroyed. He said, a mingled emotion of tenderness, of mel melancholy, and yet of gratitude to heaven afflicted, affected me to tears. And he tells about this story when his mother had destroyed the relationship. He said, Four years of exquisite wretchedness followed. Um, it was, uh, and the wound, it was not until the, the wound in my bosom was not healed until the Atlantic Ocean flowed between us. So he writes that in his diary when he's 71 years old about a love that he had when he was uh, in his late teens, yeah, 18, 19, 20, something like that. So now he doesn't have a girlfriend. So now he starts fooling around. And he writes in his diary, he writes, Victim of folly, ladies, a fatality against which I find it in vain to resist. Or he writes in another entrance, he says, It left me with painful occurrences and mortifying reflections. What he was doing and fantasizing about and what he actually did because he was fooling around like a young man. And... Um, so now we have 1790, and that's a turning point in his life. He's 23 years old, 23. And um, he goes to Philadelphia, and he t has a lot of discussions with George Washington. He discusses with George Washington. He attends sessions at the Supreme Court and the U.S. Congress, which is in Philadelphia at the time. And that these discussions with uh, George Washington and the occurrences in uh, the Supreme Court uh, changes him. And he begins from now on a whole life of educating the population with pamphlets and one, one uh, article after the other, one booklet form after the other, one speech after the other in educating uh, uh, the American, like very much like what we are doing today. And if he gets attacked, he will issue a pamphlet. And uh, you'll see that as we go through his life, uh, that the key thing for him is uh, the question about the Leibnizian idea about happiness, uh, creativity, educate people about what are the key principles of the United States, what is really in the inalienable rights of man, because that is the very backbone of, of the United States. So when he's 24 years old, he begins to write letters of publicula. Uh, friends of the people, um, and they become so popular, these letters, that they are republished in Scotland, Ireland, and France. What are they called again? Letters of Publicola, P-U-B-L-I-C-O-L-A. And, um, and then uh, <coughs> a couple of years later, uh, you have uh, a war between France and England in 1793. And uh, George Washington, Lafayette, Hamilton, uh, John Adams, uh, they want to be neutral. They don't want the United States to be involved in the war between England and uh, France. And uh, they are being massively attacked for it. So what John Quincy Adams does, he writes nine anonymous letters supporting George Washington, Hamilton, uh, John Adams, and so forth. And um, nobody knows this very, eloquent inter this very eloquent intervention. Nobody knows who it is. And uh, finally, George Washington finds out that this is John Quincy Adams, and he gets very pleased because those nine publications has a lot to do with shifting people 
regarding what they think about U.S. neutrality. I mean, people are really nasty. They want to get rid of George Washington. Uh, like the French um, foreign minister, he says publicly he wants to have Washington replaced with a, fr uh, with a friend of France. Uh, so, uh, so Washington is so pleased with this young man that the same year he nominated him to, um, for ambassador to the Netherlands. That is, George Washington uh, uh, makes John Quincy Adams, he's 26 years old now, uh, he uh, is now ambassador to the Netherlands. And uh, so this period from when he came back and went to Harvard, which he thought was so awful, until now, that's the only time in his life until he dies that he doesn't serve publicly the United States, constantly for, his, for the rest of his, li his life. And he, um, he marries, oh, this is how he looks like when he is at Harvard, 18 years old. Okay. Boy, looks pretty old, but yeah. <laughs> this is um, Louise. He marries Louise. And um, his um, mother, uh, oh, I don't have the note here, but the mother says something. Uh, at least she is like a half bred or something. I mean, she's really nasty and bitchy. Um, and um, uh, then he is made ambassador a few years later, four years later, to Prussia. And uh, let me just, uh, here we go, Berlin in 1800. Okay. And he goes to Dresden. He loves, oh, forget about him. I was going to say something. <laughs> he goes to Dresden. He loves Dresden. And for also his entire life, he gets into one project after the other. Um, in this period, he's studying Lessing. He's studying Schiller. He's really excited about Schiller's The Ghost Seer, The Geister Seer. Um, and um, he loves the bookstores. He's somewhat of a book book mania, or whatever you can call it. Every time he's been in uh, Europe, he has these trunk loads of books he has to get back to the United States. And he buys books. He loves the uh, operas in Dresden. He loves the uh, painting galleries in Dresden. Um, and um, he also intervenes all the time. I mean, since I have the picture, I can show He calls Napoleon. He mourns about Napoleon and calls him the caution ruffian. So um, now he's back. Let's see here, 17. Let me just um, go to. Oh, this is just the next one. OK. Um, so he comes back and uh, to US after being in Europe for another chunk of six and a half years. And now he's back at Howard but this time as a professor. And he's also made sec uh, state, um, uh, senator for the state of Massachusetts uh, uh, by the Federalist. At that time, they were not voted. At that time, they were uh, uh, appointed by the, um, by the uh, Federalist and, and whatever. It was not voted like we have today. So he becomes a, a state senator and then professor at Harvard. And one thing he does his entire life, he stays fit. He swims like Benjamin Franklin liked to swim. John Quincy Adams swims. There's these hilarious stories. Uh, when he was president, he would swim in the Potomac River every day for an hour. And he gets older and older. His wife is nervous about him. And then she sits him down with a family doctor. And the doctor says, no, you cannot swim more than one hour. And John Quincy Adams, that's OK. And then what he does is he puts clothes on while he swims, so it still will be more hard. So what he does there in, um, when he's still, when he's a senator and professor at Harvard, he's pretty young. He's only 35 years old. And think about what he has already done. Um, and he, um, he walks, uh, how many hours, why am I now? 
he walks to catch the stage to the, co the coach uh, to go to Harvard. There's eight miles uh, that he has to walk. So he walks eight miles, and the roads are not exactly uh, at that time the way the roads are today. And uh, he it takes him three hours and 10 minutes. He kind of times things all the way up till he's 72 years old. He's, he times, he has to walk before breakfast like two miles, and he has to do it 17 minutes per mile and, and things like that. It's like really. Um, and then um, now he's into, uh, he's part of the National Philo Philosophical Club, and he also engages in on, into all kinds of ex um, experiments, including breaking two Leiden jars. He's, in this period, he and his wife is completely into Chaucer and Shakespeare, reading for each other. And then he describes in his diary, he does it all the time, what he's doing. He changes, he tries to get up uh, in the winter time, he tries to get up before the sun gets up and uh, walk for an hour before he does anything else. But he, he tries to push himself all the time to get more work done. So he, he always gets up early. So in this period when he's senator, he gets up and reads six chapters of the Bible, three of them in Greek and three of them in German. <laughs> and then he spayed until breakfast. He loves to do gardening. And then he works on his lecture. And then he takes the eight-mile walk to Boston to catch the, um, the coach to get to, um, to Harvard. In this period, too, he's comparing translations of Homer's uh, Iliad. So, uh, he has the uh, original Greek. And then he compares the different translations, which one is the best. And he, grow, he also, in this period, 35 years old, he draws up a chronological index of laws and treaties of the United States. This is just kind of like things you do in your spare time for fun. And he um, uh, published a five-part series, which I've read some of them. It's really interesting of essays called, again, all the time, educate, like the way LaRouche think, educate the population, educate the population. And these essays are called Serious Reflections Addressed to the Citizens of Massachusetts, where the key theme of it is to encourage people to adopt a national outlook, like to think about US, United States as a nation. And here we come, uh, now there is a real, uh, test of character uh, because Chesapeake is fired upon. You have uh, a lot of problems regarding uh, American sailors, sailors being impressed and the British want to control the seas. And uh, so in 1807, uh, Chesapeake is being fired upon. And uh, most people say it's okay. And the Federalists I say it's okay that uh, the British did that. And um, why do you think that's the case, that they want to be subservient to Britain? Money, money. money. Boston and trade and so forth. So, uh, so he, um, and they are basically prepared to, that the Union is going to be destroyed and, and things like that to go with Britain around when Britain is firing upon one of America's ships. So John Quincy Adams uh, stands up and he attacks this uh, publicly and very hard. And his mother, Abigail, and he's being fired. The Federalists said, no, then you are not senator for us anymore. So he's being fired by the Federalists over the Chesapeake incident uh, because uh, he went up against the British. And uh, his mother, he said, um, first, first uh, himself, um, uh, because he stands quite alone. He said that to resist that, I was ready, if necessary, to sacrifice everything I have in life, even life itself. That is, I had to stand up on principle for what the United States represent and against this encroachment. So, okay, so he's fired. And his mother writes, um, this is the worst, she writes. This, this staggered my belief. This is inconsistent with principles. And she, this is what she writes to her son. Her husband, John Adams, that's why I think why he was not as good as his son, because he writes to John Quincy Adams, I don't agree with your mother. But uh, he couldn't kind of really give her a little, 
light spanking or something to kind of get her to. But anyway, um, and again, he issues a pamphlet, 5,000 copies pamphlet, to really uh, illustrate what is behind, um, behind this. Then, in 1809, he is um, made ambassador to Russia. And he is to be gone for eight years. He is 42 years old. So, um, so he's been in the Netherlands, he's been in Prussia, Germany, today's Germany, now he is in Russia. And there he becomes a really good friend with Alexander I. This is St. Petersburg, Russia at the time. It's a place that gets very cold in the winter and Alexander tells him how to get used to the cold and how to take cold air baths and um, things like that. They get really good friend, him and Alexander. Uh, Alexander is only 32 and uh, they take long walks together and uh, Alexander is trying to pick young Quincy Adams' brain as much as he can. And uh, here, uh, John Quincy Adams, his entire life he writes poetry and um, some of them are really funny but I'll not go through this today. And he, uh, when he is in St. Petersburg and working with Alexander where they take these long walks every day and so on, he also uh, gets into something totally new and uh, it's, it, I'll tell you in a funny way because he begins to get back pain. And he can't understand because he's in pretty good shape, walking, exercising, cold air baths, getting used to the cold in Russia and so forth and how, what, wrong. But the problem is he realizes why, because he's getting totally crazy about stargazing. And it's stargazing. And that is, that is very good to do at that location. And every night he goes up on the roof where he stays and he would in there like that. <laughs> <laughs> so he's getting problems with his uh, back. And he says in this period, he says, my studies spread and widens before me. Science remains the most delightful of occupations. And he says, I really, the day should be 48 hours and not 24 hours. And also in this period, he often visits Lafayette. He said, Lafayette is a long life friend of him, he's older, much older, but if you again think about the ones that, the older people that he uh, gets together with are people like George Washington, uh, Benjamin Franklin, Hamilton, uh, Lafayette, that's the people that are his older buddies, so to speak. So, uh, so he is sent back, let me just see here, I get the whole, yeah. He has come back to the United States in 1817 because um, he is now going to be Secretary of State under James Monroe. And uh, James Monroe was president twice. So John Quincy Adams is Secretary of State twice. Um, on the boat back from Europe, he says that um, he's 50 years old and he says, the worst thing that could befall me, uh, he writes to his wife. I mean, he, like the last night he's in Europe, he goes to a beautiful opera, uh, John Giovanni, and he, he really loves the fountains in Europe, the beautiful buildings. I mean, Washington doesn't have a fountain. Washington is muddy. You have slave trade in the district. Uh, it's quite disgusting. And it's hot and humid. Can you imagine? Washington DC with, forget about air conditioning, but not even a fan, and the mosquitoes and the whole thing. And that's where he's going, right? And uh, he writes to his wife, I mean, uh, the worst thing, I, I can give you the real quote, but it's pretty precise. Uh, he writes to her, the worst thing that could befell me is if I had to spend the rest of my life in Europe. Everything I live for, everything I care about is the United States. So it was not, um, you had all the books, you had the architecture, you had all the great things in Europe, but what he really lived for was the United States, so that he would write, that's the worst thing that could befell me. I kind of looked at it because I come from you. Uh oh. So, um, so he comes back and he becomes Secretary of State. And this is what I'll do a lot in my second class. 
because he's the greatest Secretary of State America had ever had. This is in that period where he makes the United States from sea to shining sea. He writes the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine is called Monroe Doctrine because he was under Monroe, Monroe but he, it was written by John Quincy Adams. And uh, he said himself that this was, uh, I mean, he was so excited. He was full of joy. I think he writes something, ejaculations of joy in his, um, in his um, diary. And the Monroe Doctrine was to make sure that the United States does not go in and involve itself in wars uh, in other nations. Uh, and only if you are attacked do you go to war and that Europe stay out of South America and North America, stay out. Uh, so, um, and there's a single handle, he did a lot of organizing for it, which I also will do in my second class, uh, by giving speeches, writings, and so forth, to prepare people to support what he was proposing and putting forward. So, and there's all these treaties also in this period, where he, think about it, he's been diplomat in Europe for 20 years. So he kind of knows the tricks. He kind of knows how they think. So when it comes to the Spanish and the French and the British and so forth, he makes sure that the United States gets Florida, gets Louisiana, uh, the, get the higher border up between Canada and the United States. I'll show that uh, to you next time I talk about it. And of course, the whole West Coast. It is him as a single person that makes sure we have the nation that we have today. Um, nobody else. He reads 40 newspapers per week. Uh, he, he also at this time, he starts that already in Europe. He is completely obsessive with one thing after the other. So in Europe, when he is in Russia, he starts um, thinking about weight and measures. And his wife thinks that he is crazy. I mean, this is the only thing that is occupying him from morning to night and calculations and things like that. And um, so I couldn't understand, since this was John Quincy Adams that proposed, and, and then when he became Secretary of State, that he wrote himself what now the policy should be for the United States. And I couldn't understand because all the books, all the biographies and so forth, you say that he supported the decimal system. But that's because people didn't read the whole thing. He says it's good in the beginning of this major treatise he writes as a Secretary of State. But then he concludes in the very end why it should be uh, inches, whatever it's called in uh, the system we have today. That's John Quincy Adams too. So, um, but uh, this whole period what he does as Secretary of State and also as President, I looked at it yesterday and I think it actually calls for, uh, because that is really, concerning the American system, concerning foreign policy, the American system concerning domestic policy, uh, and making the United States. And I have an idea of the United States as its manifest destiny. He writes that already when he's quite young, is from sea to shining sea. That's what his conception from his very young. And then he uses his mind and his insight to make sure that this happens. So, uh, after he's been Secretary of State for two times, he becomes President. And it's very narrow, and also this I'll take up more in a, in a second class, uh, because you have the slave owners, and that's where I want to take a whole part, which is not so known for people, what he actually does regarding organizing in the North against slavery. Uh, if it had not been for what he did as Secretary of State and President, uh, in, in uh, industrializing the North and mobilizing uh, the population in the North against slavery, Lincoln could never have done what he did. So um, every single biography too you will read about him says that he was bad as a president. Uh, he, he failed as a president. Um, he writes in his diary how he's very, he is working and working on his inauguration speech. And um, uh, it's very narrow, Jackson could have won. Huh? And so he works on his inauguration speech and he knows he's going to get opposition. And he says he's gripped by an anxiety that he cannot, uh, he said, it keeps, it's so deep, this anxiety, I cannot get rid of it. And uh, he delivers his speech where he calls for 
uh, education a, a university in um, Washington DC he calls about building lighthouses in the sky people re uh, ridicule him that is to build observatories because Europe as he says has 130 observatories America doesn't have a single one um, uh, he calls for uh, internal improvement he had done that already as a state senator uh, and um, uh, he wants to, uh, he started as a president, he had the West Point engineers outline the railroads, uh, 60 such projects, uh, the first one Baltimore, Ohio, uh, and canals, internal improvements, he, and people, there is massive opposition uh, to him uh, doing so. So this that he was if you see, and I have maps of it to see, you can see how the expansion of the water management, railroads, and so forth. Um, uh, none of the biographies takes this up. And that was the basis for Lincoln, because the North was much more industrialized and developed than the South, which was very important for the North to winning the Civil War later on. So that I'll take up more about the creation of the whole United States in a second class because I would actually like to go through it with maps and how he does it so people can see how this whole nation came together under him. So what I want to do now is I want to uh, take a different part and that is his last time of his life, which he said was the best time of his life. He... Um, he is actually asked by the um, people of the uh, Congressional District of Plymouth. Uh, we had given a really nice speech in 1809. Um, he's asked to run for Congress. He doesn't campaign or anything, and he's elected to Congress the 1st of November, 1830. And uh, he's 63 years old, and again, He's been ambassador to five nations. He's been secretary of state. He's been state secretary. He's been <laughs> ambassador to five nations, uh, state sec uh, senator, okay. secretary of state for two terms. He's been president. And now he's 63. He's elected to Congress. And he remains a congressman for 18 years until he dies. Um, and he says that this is the greatest time of his life the last 18 years. He writes, he says, um, he says, no election or appointment conferred upon me, conferred upon me ever gave me so much pleasure. My own condition is now of unparalleled comfort and enjoyment. It is my wish to fill every moment of my time with some action of the mind which may contribute to the pleasure or the improvement of my fellow creatures. That's when he become, uh, That's what he writes in his diary when he had become elected. And you have to think about it, 1830. Well, Jackson has become president. And um, Jackson is beginning right away to uh, give the states more rights. He's also uh, beginning to take down the Second National Bank. And I'll go through that in my second class too, because John Quincy Adams is pre prevented in US Congress for talking about why Jackson is wrong uh, about taking down the Second National Bank. And he's barred from talking. So he writes a 70, 80 page paper and publish it so that his ideas can come out anyway. But I'll take that up later. Uh, what I want to do is to go through a little bit of how it looked regarding slavery in the United States at that time. Uh, and it's a little difficult. I'll do it slowly and clearly so to give people a picture how the situation looked like. Because when he becomes here he is, he's an old man at that time, 63. It's not like a 63-year-old today. Um, uh, Jackson has won. This, uh, the slave owners have a tremendous power, and they're getting more and more. The country is being destroyed, and um, he doesn't give up. He really fights, and I think that's also a um, very good example for every single one of us today. 
that the way you live your life uh, is to continue to develop and fight uh, so that what you have done becomes the most prof profitable for the future. And then you live on in what other people do that you created for them. So let me give you an overview because he becomes congressman in 1830. So you had in this period from 1810 to 1850, that is 40 years, you had 100,000 slaves that had escaped north. In a 10-year period, 10 period, period from 1850 to 1860, that is just leading up to the um, Civil War, you had 50,000 fleeing north. That is an escalation. I mean, the south was being emptied out, so to speak. I also want to point out that um, Frederick Douglass flees in 1838 from Maryland, where he's a slave. So 1838, that's eight years after John Quincy Adams uh, had been elected to Congress. And I want to, people to remember that because um, Frederick Douglass write about that the importance of what John Quincy Adams did in Congress to get he himself and other slaves excited and optimistic and deciding to flee. So just remember that. Harriet Tubman flees 11 years later in 1849 from the same county. And that county is actually emptied out. All the property is running away. <laughs> so. <laughs> Do you know what the total slave population was? Yeah, so what you have, I, I was looking it up because you have, I could not find for every single year, but I could, oh. But I could find for 1840. In 1840, we had 24 states, and there were 17 million Americans. And out of those 17 million Americans, there was 2.5 million slaves and 385,000 free blacks. That's the situation in 1840, when he's still in Congress, OK? So uh, I know it's a, number, a, number, a lot of numbers I give you here, but uh, just try, and if you don't catch it, just ask me again, because in order to kind of s uh, see how it fits in what he does. Between 1835 and 1836, people have begun to come in with petitions to US Congress to call for the end of slavery or the slave trade in DC. Think about it, DC had slave trade, well, until very, very late in the, uh, the center of the nation. So. Um, so in, in that, that year, 176 petition calling for the abolition of, of slave trade. And in DC, there's 35,000 total signatures on these petition. Uh, well, um, between 1937 and 1838, that is the two next years after what I just gave you. So. 35 to 36, 176 petitions, 35,000 total. The following two years, and it's because it's completely done, Quincy Adams. So, uh, so uh, 37, 38, you have um, 693 petitions with 2 million total of signatures. Mm. And um, John Quincy Adams, um, oh, I didn't write it up here. Ah, uh, um, he had most of them. That's the whole thing. But anyway, um, they filled those petitions filled a room 20, uh, 30, 40 feet, closely packed from the floor to the ceiling. So it escalated massively. And I had a note. I just uh, didn't put it down because he. Um, oh no. No, but most of them, that was his. That was the whole thing. Maybe it's all of them. So maybe I have it elsewhere when I go through it now. So I would like Bob and um, Rogers to be ready because um, he is really uh, upset about the question about slavery. Um, like he writes in his diary, he says, oh, if but one man could arise with a genius capable of, of comprehending, a heart capable of supporting, and an utterance capable of communicating those eternal truths that belong to this question. 
Slavery is an outrage upon the goodness of God. And many, many others. He will say 20 years before the Civil War, he, again and again he will write in the, his diary, we are going to have a civil war in this country uh, because of the slavery question, because that goes against the very principles upon which the Union and this nation is founded. So now Bob and uh, Bob Weser is uh, representing the South. Can you come up here, Bob? <laughs> yeah. And uh, and um, Roger, Roger is John Quincy Adams. You can do it from wherever you want to. You can do it maybe here because of the pictures they can see how beautiful you look like. So, 71 years old, uh, February the 6th, 1837. John Quincy Adams, he initiates one of the most extraordinary weeks in the history of U.S. Congress. Um, there's been put a gag rule against uh, mainly him, that you cannot present any petition uh, regarding slavery in the U.S. Congress. That gag rule is to uh, stay for nine years. So the rule is on when this is happening, okay? So John Quincy Adams, Oh, okay. So, um, uh, and uh, so John Quincy Adams present hundreds and hundreds of petitions regarding the slave issue in U.S. Congress. And what you have to understand, because the, the, the importance for this is that at that time you have people sitting taking notes in U.S. Congress journalists and so forth, and that is being uh, printed in the newspapers, and people read the newspapers. So what you are going to listen to is just a tiny little excerpt of what went on day after day in U.S. Congress, where John Quincy Adams flanks and fools the Southerners. And that is being written up and printed in the newspapers in the North, so that people see the slaver powers were organized. That was money and control and support from the British. The uh, Norths were not organized. They just had some wake thing, but they had no idea really what was going on and so forth. John Quincy Adams organizes the population in the North to understand what's going on. And uh, that's why you had this massive explosion of petitions, was because people were reading day for day and following the drama in US Congress. So he has a gag rule. And so I'll just give you uh, a few tidbits. Um, uh, one of the, one of the, uh, in this one day, February 6, he, uh, he uh, goes up John Quincy Adams and he says, I don't know if this petition is genuine. This is from nine ladies of Fredericksburg, Virginia, and they are praying for the end of slave trade in D.C. And he says, quote, I do not know what would happen to them if I name the ladies given the present mood in the state of Virginia, so therefore I'm not going to name them. So he puts it down, and um, the guy sitting next to him, the congressman sitting next to him, is from Fredericksburg, Virginia, and he's very curious to figure out what it is. So he sneak peeks and look at it. And um, he then uh, says the following. I will state in this place and on my responsibility that the name of no lady is attached to that paper. I do believe there's a single one of them. I do believe, I do not believe there is a single one of them of decent respectability. I believe the signatures to be genuine and I recognize only one name which I had known before and that's the name of a free mulatto woman of the worst fame and reputation. <laughs> I've been raised in Fredericksburg, and I believe I'm acquainted with all persons of respectability residing there, and I can say there's not one respectable name attached to that paper. And then there's a whole lot of discussion because these Southerners say to John Quincy Adams, 
we come from there. You should have asked us if these people were respectable or not. Why didn't you ask us? This is a lesson for you. You should have asked us. So. The honorable gentleman makes it a crime because I presented a petition which he affirms to be from colored women, which women were of infamous character. As the honorable gentleman says, prostitutes, I think the gentleman said. Oh my God. As to the infamous character of the woman in question, I mention that not because I deem it as a reason for refusing the right to petition, but because I wish to wipe away the stain from the ladies of Fredericksburg. <laughs> Honorable gentlemen, Mr. Adams, I'm sure that no ladies from Fredericksburg have sent such a petition to this house. The gentleman from Virginia says he knows these women. <laughs> <laughs> They are infamous. <laughs> How does the gentleman know it? <laughs> no, I did not don't. say that I knew the women personally. Yeah. I, I, knew, I knew from others. <laughs> the character of one of them was notoriously bad. <laughs> I am glad to hear the honorable gentleman disclaim any knowledge of these women. For I was going to ask, if they were infamous women, who then was it that had made them infamous? Oh, 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 oh careful, careful. Not, I believe, their own color, but their masters. I have heard it said in proof of this fact, and I am inclined to believe it in this case, that there in the South exist great resemblances between the progeny of the colored people and the white men who claim the possession of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, perhaps the charge of being infamous might be retorted upon those who made it as originating from themselves. <laughs> so, this was written up in the newspapers and people read it in the North. He flanked these bastards again and again. And the same day, the very same day, um, he um, uh, says the following. Yeah, just, and then I tell afterwards, yeah. I hold in my hand a paper on which before it is presented, I desire to have the decision of the speaker. It is a petition from 22 persons declaring themselves to be slaves. I wish to know whether the speaker considers such a petition as coming within the, wither, coming within the order of the house. This paper purports to come from slaves, and it is one of those petitions which occurs to my mind as not being what it purports to be. It is signed by partly, it is signed partly by persons who cannot write by making their mark, and partly by persons whose handwriting would manifest that they received the education of slaves. I am requested to present this petition. I will send it to the chair. So this is the same day you have to kind of see, and all hell breaks loose because the whole question is, you, uh, one thing is to have petitions for freeing slaves, but slaves have no right to have a petition. And they're a huge argument. And uh, so they call for rejection of the petition and punishing the perpetrator of this evil deed. I believe the house shall punish severely such an infraction of its decorum and rules. If the house does not inflict any punishment, for such flagrant violations of its dignity as this, it will be better for the representatives from the slaveholding states to go home at once. If this is not done and done promptly, every member of this house shall immediately in a body quit this house and go home to their constituents. We no longer have any business here. And people begin to scream in the Congress. And again, all this is reported in the newspapers, okay? Expel him, expel the mover. Uh, the petition should be taken from the house and burnt. 
and there is a motion to censure John Quincy Adams for gross disrespect for the House. And then what they do for four days straight, they discuss motions that the different members of Congress has proposed for how the censorship should uh, be doing, or how it should be done. They are amending it, they are reviving it, they are expanding upon it. And uh, what they say about John Quincy Adams is what he has done is wanton, absurd and defensive, odious and indefensible, unquestionably reprehensible, disgraceful and unpardonable. And they call for a grand jury. They're getting really worked up. Can you imagine they discuss this for five days, uh, that he has presented this petition issued by slaves? Okay. Did the gentleman think he could frighten me from my purpose by the threat of a grand jury? If that was his object, let me tell him he mistook his man. I am not to be frightened from the discharge of a duty by the indignation of the gentleman from South Carolina, not by all the grand juries in the universe. And then John Quincy Adams has a really beautiful, I just got too much, really beautiful intervention where he talks about that the petition is like a prayer and uh, how that is in relationship to the, to the creator. And um, let's take... Uh, the South. It makes not the slightest difference. <laughs> it's an attempt to introduce a petition from slaves for any object, as insolent if it be for one purpose as for another. It is the naked fact of the presentation from slaves. Slaves have no right to petition. They're property, not persons. <laughs> they have no political rights, and even their civil rights must be claimed through their masters. Having no political rights, Congress has no power in relation to them, and therefore no right to receive their petition. They are property, not persons, under our Constitution. Mm -hmm. The Constitution is the paramount rule of the House, and any attempt, however made, to present petition from them is a violation of that Constitution, and a flagrant disrespect and insult to a portion of its members. And another guy say, look, John Quincy Adams, you could as well have presented a petition from a cow or a horse, because that's also property. It's just a different kind of property. But what is the difference? It's just another species. Slaves are property. And then... A gentleman said yesterday that he as soon would receive a petition from a horse or a dog as from <laughs> slaves. <laughs> Sir, say I, if a dog or a horse had the power of speech and of writing, and it would send me a petition, I would present it to the house. <laughs> I, if it were a famished horse or dog, I would present it. <laughs> and I guess this is different yeah. sections of the speech. Yeah. <laughs> if the creator of the universe did not deny to the lowest, the humblest, and the meanest the right of petition and supplication, were they to say they would not hear the prayer of these petitioners because they were slaves? If this house decides that it will not receive petitions from slaves under any circumstances, it will cause the name of this country to be enrolled amongst the first of the barbarous nations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to keep, thanks. This is for later. I, I want to, um, I want to um, again, think about uh, how this is going into the newspapers every day as being read by the population in the North. And this was just one little excerpt. And um, uh, I mean, John Quincy Adams is being threatened with death threats all the time. He says, um, uh, he says after he's gotten a lot of death threats and getting very ill, he says, rely upon, an, he says it to himself, rely upon an overwhelming consciousness of rectitude. To withstand, to withstand multitudes is the only unerring test of decisive character. And um, uh, Frederick Douglass uh, a couple of times uh, uh, writes about John Quincy Adams. He gives him as an example, for example, uh, John Quincy Adams had said that if we have a war in the United States, uh, the U.S. government could free the slaves. 
So uh, when you have that during the Civil War, he uh, gives speeches and so forth, Frederick Douglass does, where he says, look, uh, we now have uh, the right, according uh, to the law, to free the slaves, and uh, the slaveholders have no... But he also writes, Frederick Douglass, he says that um, the, the war waged by John Quincy Adams uh, in uh, the House, uh, in the Congress, was uh, extraordinarily important. He reported to an audience, Frederick Douglass, in 1841, that while still a slave, he had read a speech by John Quincy Adams in which Adams was attempting to present petitions to the House for the abolition of slavery, specifically for the District of Columbia. And he added that he had read the speech aloud to other slave boys. Quote, waiters hear their masters talk at table cursing the abolitionists, John Quincy Adams, meaning of the language they're using. But, noted Douglas, it was the knowledge that this fight was going on which gave slaves the hope that they would soon be free. So it went through the grapevine that this was going on in, in, the, in the US Congress. There was people that was fighting, and that also gave them courage. I mean, there's no incident that he fled in uh, 1838. So, um, uh, oh. so I want, this is no um, accident that John Quincy Adams get, uh, oh yeah, this is a whole bunch of pictures I didn't show, okay. Um, it's no accident that he gets involved in Amistad. And uh, I would, how many people saw the movie, the Amistad movie? Okay. This is really an awful movie. It uh, has nothing to do with history. Huh? No, but that was not the point. Uh, it was just to show a lot of uh, ugliness and horror. And then uh, John Quincy Adams is portrayed as an old fuffy duffy that uh, is taking care of his roses and so on. But this was a real fight also of the principles of the United States, uh, the Amistad thing. John Quincy Adams was involved from the very beginning. Uh, the the uh, lawyer, Loring, who takes care of the Amistad people, they, uh, he writes immediately to John Quincy Adams and asks his help. And John Quincy Adams sends him a private letter back, and, uh, which Loring gives out to the newspapers. And it's published all over the place where uh, John Quincy Adams calls for compassion, sympathy, justice. And John Quincy Adams... I, I think a lot of people don't even know what you're referring to. With the Amistad? Yeah. Okay, thanks. What you had is... It's all because when you've been working with, a lot with something, yeah. then you just think, of course, everybody knows this. <laughs> uh, because even though slave trade was prohibited, uh, what was done was that you had people taken from Africa and then unloaded in uh, different islands uh, in the Caribbean and then put on other boats so that they didn't come from Africa and in that way it continued to take place. So the Amistad case is that uh, the people on that boat takes over, the slaves takes over and uh, take power over the ship and then they end up being taken and they're in jail for 18 months. And um, there's a big battle because um, uh, they say, well, this is property, this is slaves. And uh, uh, Loring, with John Quincy Adams backing, says, absolutely not, they should go back to Africa. So that's the battle. And, uh, and John Quincy Adams is involved from day one. And I would really uh, recommend people, time will not permit, but I will, me to, to to um, do what I maybe should have done, but he gives a um, seven and a half hour speech at the US Supreme Court. Uh, and because of that speech, uh, the uh, people from Amistad are sent home. Uh, and what he does is he goes, and you can get it on the internet. It's a delightful speech. Um, uh, and he comes into, this is the old Supreme Court, and there was two uh, Declaration of Independence hanging on the, on the wall. And he uses the ideas of the 
uh, Declaration of Independence points to it, and his whole argument for seven and a half hour is that this goes against the Declaration of Independence. And um, as he said, I know of no other law. The case has to be decided on the basis of universal natural law. And in this, he attacks the US Secretary of State. He attacks President Van Buren, who is president at the time. He attacks Hobbes, because it comes from Hobbes that if you win over somebody else, you can make that person a slave. Uh, he ridiculed the Spanish. I mean, this is so sharp, uh, philosophically, politically. Uh, Van Buren had uh, in um, uh, 37, when he became president in his inauguration speech, he said, I no way I'm ever going to um, uh, ban slave trade in DC. So he and, and uh, John Quincy Adams was very much on Doggerhead. And that's where the movie is off, because the role of what John Quincy Adams played and what the fight was uh, around it is not covered in the movie. And the fight is really what does the United States represent concerning the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And he writes in his, um, so I will really recommend this speech. Um, you can just write uh, Amistad and it should come up. Uh, John Quincy Adams before the Supreme Court, the Amistad case or something. M-A-M-I-S-T-A-D, yeah, yeah. And um, says after he'd been in the U.S. Supreme Court for seven and a half hours, uh, he goes home and he writes in his diary. Roger. I am yet to revise for publication my argument in the case of the Amistad Africans and in merely glancing over the slave trade papers lent me by Mr. Fox, I find impulses of duty upon my own conscience which I cannot resist, while on the other hand are the magnitude, the danger, the insurmountable burden of labor to be encountered in the undertaking to touch upon the slave trade. No one else will undertake it. No one but a spirit unconquerable by man, woman, or fiend can undertake it but with the heart of martyrdom. The world, the flesh, and all the devils in hell are arrayed against any man who now in this North American Union shall dare to join the standard of Almighty God to put down the African slave trade. And what can I, upon the verge of my 74th birthday, with a shaken hand, a darkening eye, a drowsy brain, and with all my faculties dropping from me one by one, as the teeth are dropping from my head, <coughs> what can I do for the cause of God and man, for the progress of human emancipation, for the suppression of the African slave trade? yet my conscience presses me on. Let me but die upon the breach. Mm. Well, that's where you would really enjoy when you, when you read this, because he ridicules them, he attacks them. Like when you have heard Lynn talk about Obama or Netan not Netanyahu, but earlier with Cheney and so forth, he is sharp. I mean, he's really sharp against Hobbes, against Van Buren, against the Spanish and so forth, and he ridicules them. So it's a real, real fighting document. So, uh, and he continues, like he gave, I will recommend a speech, uh, 1939, uh, sorry, 1839, um, which is the Jubilee of the 50 years for George Washington. Um, and it's immediately sold in 8,000 copies because uh, you had had Jackson and then you had Van Buren and things were going really bad. So John Quincy Adams used all strengths and all what he had to write one speech and one uh, essay after the other to educate the population. And that speech, for example, from, from uh, 1839, I'll probably take it up a little bit more in, next time, uh, but that was used massively as an argument uh, on the eve of the Civil War. Uh, 
the ideas that was expressed in that speech in um, 1839. So uh, I want to, um, and then uh, I said earlier how he's, he says we're going to have a civil war on this uh, because of, of, uh, of the slavery. And in um, 1844, he gives a speech in Boston in a famous temple. It's actually the same temple where Frederick Douglass, Douglass celebrated the Declaration of Emancipation. Uh, it's the exact same place. I actually want to go there one time if it still stands uh, to visit when I go to Boston. I'm looking at Frank because he has to do it. But he gives this incredible rousing speech. It's from October 1844. It's a speech at the Tremont Temple. And he says, it does exist still, that place? Yeah. Okay, I would love to go there. He gives a speech, a fiery speech, and he's an old man. Freedom and slavery are headed toward a deadly conflict of arms. To our next Texas will bring the blast of the trumpet for a civil war. Young men of Boston, burnish your armor, prepare for the conflict. That is in 1844. Uh, I mean, that's 15 years before the uh, Civil War and earlier had I want to. I forgot to say one thing um, uh, is that uh, he spoke at one point, he spoke for three weeks. He made his one person filibuster in the U.S. Congress for three weeks in order to prevent Texas from becoming <coughs> a slave state. And he succeeded. Van Buren got so freaked out about it because also that would be printed in the newspapers every day. So later on, it was a part as a, uh, became a, a slave state. But in the first round, John Quincy Adams succeeded yeah. single-handedly with a three-week yeah. filibuster, speaking every day as an old man in the U.S. Congress. I want to end with um, uh, a also something I really would recommend that uh, for people to read. Um, but I remember I said that when he became president that he really wanted to have an observatory in the United States and he was ridiculed. Well, uh, there was a uh, young man called Om Omsley Mitchell and he, um, his father died, so he left his mother when he was 12 because she had the children to take care of. He didn't want to be a burden to her. And he worked his way up. He got into West Point. He became an engineer. He was part of the people, actually, of the group uh, building the railroads, um, in, uh, what do you call it, making the survey for the, rail, the first railroads and so on. He was crazy about astronomy. So he... Um, uh, wanted to build an observatory, the fir U.S. first observatory. And what he would do to raise money is he would make these big plates and then he would make holes in the plates of the, of the sky, or the stars in the sky, and then he would put light behind so he could explain to people what they saw in the sky. And he would have thousands of people coming listening to his lectures. And in that way he got money and he signed people up for subscriptions to what he was doing. And um, so John Quincy Adams, who was totally crazy about astronomy himself, he uh, uh, helped the young man. He gave him letters of recommendation. And the young man went to the best mirror makers in Europe to buy a mirror. Uh, but he didn't have enough money, so he had to come back and raise some more money and then go a second time. Um, and uh, so when John Quincy Adams is 74 years old, uh, he is asked to come out to Cincinnati, Ohio, to give a speech at the laying of the cornerstone. This is November, and it takes 14 days to get there. And it's raining and storming and cold. And people are really, what, see what John Quincy Adams, um, he really expressed um, what Americans really thought was the very best with themselves. So whenever he stopped to take a ferry or whatever, people would gather in huge groups and they would ask, speech, give us a speech. <laughs> so it was very exhausted for him, exhausting for him. And then he comes out to Cincinnati and he gives a speech. Uh, and this is the last thing. Um, uh, this one is called an oration, laying the cornerstone. Uh, hold on. 
they the cornerstone uh, of, a, of an astronomical observatory on the 10th of November, 1843. So he gives this speech. It's a beautiful speech. And again, everything is uh, surround or is, is focused upon the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the very fabric of the United States. So I pulled out just a few quotes uh, for Roger to read. And then I'll end uh, just with a few concluding remarks. So I should just read yes, please, through. just read it through. Okay. So he's referring to the Declaration of Independence. They appealed to their rights as men, and they declared that they held those rights to be self-evident truths, that they held them in common with all mankind, because all men were born equal, that bestowed as they were by their Creator, they never could be divested of them, even by themselves, and much less could they be wrested from them by the might of others. What an exalted and sublime idea of the character of man. How must our nature swell with pride at the consciousness of being members of a community by the fundamental principles of which every soul belonging to it is born to the inheritance of freedom. The Declaration of Independence acknowledges no such principle. It recognizes no despotism, monarchical, aristocratic, or democratic. It declares individual man born with rights, of which, while blamelessly possessed, no government can deprive him. But by the very nature of the grant, the right can be possessed only upon the condition of respecting the same rights in all other men. And then much later, that is in the end of his speech, this long speech that he gave. Yeah. The form of government founded upon the principle of the natural equality of mankind and of which the unalienable rights of the individual man are the cornerstone is the government best adapted to the pursuit of happiness as well of every individual as of the community. It is the only actual or imaginable human government in which self-love and social are the same. Of such a government, intense patriotism must be the vital spark. Animated by the immortal spirit of Christian benevolence, which enjoins self-love as the standard of brotherly affection and proclaims all mankind as a brotherhood of one kindred blood. The whole soul of every citizen of such a republic must be devoted to improve the condition of his country and of mankind. And while the stargazers from observatories multiplying in the four corners of the globe almost in, the, in proportion to the multiplication of the new discovered stars themselves force upon the mind of man the conclusion that every new accession to his knowledge acquired by his unceasing and untiring efforts are but spurs to stimulate the ever restless activity of his intellectual powers for the acquisition of more. The voices of your forefathers, founders of your social compact, calling from their graves in harmony louder and sweeter than the music of the spheres, command you in piety to your God and in patriotism to your country to patronize and encourage the arts and sciences and all good literature. There is not one study in the whole circle of sciences more useful to the race of man upon earth or more suited to the dignity of his destination as being endowed with reason 
and born to immortality than the science of the stars. So he clearly would have supported uh, LaRouche's program for space colonization today. And you can also see that he lives in LaRouche. And he lives in every single uh, person in America as a cultural heritage, if it is so that you seek it. And that is really the key, I think, for uh, to have with us in the fight today and to win the United States back. Because it comes down to some very simple ideas uh, as embedded in the Declaration of Independence and the preemptive constitution. It's very simple. And then you can see Obama is not American. Forget about his birth certificate. But um, <laughs> I mean, just the Monroe Doctrine, look at it. Um, uh, and every single thing that John Quincy Adams stood for and stands for today uh, is not being adhered to in the current uh, government of the United States. So I will end there. I, will, I know that this is just part of the picture, uh, but there was so much. So I thought, I, since I'm going to stay here for a little while, uh, I thought of taking it in a couple of portions. And then we can take how he created uh, America later on. But uh, the fight for the inalienable rights of man, also when it comes to the weakest and when it comes to the world, and this is for the whole world, for every individual in the world, the principles upon which the United States represents. So instead of going out killing other people, we should be collaborating with other nations for mutual development. And that's what we should be doing. And that is the American thing to do. Everything else is colonialism, oligarchism, fascism, Everything that the United States does not represent uh, is what is represented by Obama today. So I don't know if people have any questions. Yeah? Yeah, one thing that immediately came to my mind was that his love of astronomy. I mean, do you know if he actually knew Kepler? Read oh, yeah, Kepler? it's in here. Just read it. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. He read Kepler. Oh, yeah, it's in here. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this guy. Uh, uh, he dove into, he also, in Europe, he translated when he was in Europe. I mean, he just did one thing after the other. His brain was just a sponge. Well, he also fought because he thought that he had, and this is very similar to LaRouche, he thought that he had to spend all energy and all time for the sake of mankind uh, to promote uh, whatever he could. And that, I find it so... Actually, that's why I wanted to take up focus on the last years of his life, uh, because I find it so delightful that this guy in his last, that he thought that the best years of his life was the last 18 years, where everything was going down the drain, like a little bit what we can see today. Yeah. Like he is there, and the slave power is getting worse and worse. The British are taking over, and he sees we have a civil war coming ahead. And he's being attacked and death threats, and he's getting older and weaker, and he thinks that this is the best years of his life. And indeed, if he had not done what he did, Lincoln could not have won. Yeah. Um, uh, but also to have the courage and the strength, even if it doesn't look like that you're going to win, and maybe you're not going to win in your lifetime, which is the case for him. But he still continued to fight every single day with the teeth dropping out. <laughs> yeah? With regard to the manifest testing, what was his attitude towards the Indians? Uh, I will take that up next time because it's a longer thing. But he, he was opposite to Jackson, OK? Yeah. Because basically what I'm going to do next time, I want to go through the treaties and the maps it would just be too much to do. I am going to do that very shortly. Yeah. Yeah? I'd like to take a little license here yeah. and commend you for your in-depth history, mm -hmm. your research, mm -hmm. your delivery, and your constituents. I, I got a great deal from your constituents. Everything was very, very eloquently performed. Thank you. Thank you ever Thank you. so much. Thank you. You had another one? Yeah. Are there any decent biographies? Yeah. Uh, 
not really. There is one, I think, but it's not decent. Uh, it's by uh, Nagel, N-A-G-E-L. But he also criticizes him for um, uh, when he's president. I really think, and see, I might be crazy, but I mean, I just started rereading certain sections of the diary again. I get a complete kick out of it. Um, uh, it's yeah, it's many many volumes. So, uh, but it's delightful if you're tired, and you just take read one thing after the other. I mean, it's so it you get to read. But I would what I would do is, and I could make a list for next time. Uh, I have had great delight. I mean, reading the Amistad. It's a little bit like Papers by LaRouche, it's the same way. Or reading the speech he gave at the uh, laying of the cornerstone. Or he has this, which I'm going to take up next time, he has this incredible speech, which, which gets me totally aroused every time I read it, from uh, 1821, where he is beginning to enforce a July speech, where he's preparing people, or organizing people to support the Monroe Doctrine. Whoa, that's a speech. Um, so he has one speech after the other, one writing after the other, and that is really where you get to know him. Uh, his 1839 speech I mentioned, excellent. So that's what I have, what I have had. The, so I used some biographies, but I didn't really like them. It's the same with Benjamin Franklin. There's nothing written about him. You have to go to himself. But you can get, if you use Nagel, or N-A-G-E-L, I don't know how you pronounce it in English, you can get a certain overview. And then I can make a list of mm -hmm. key things. I have read that, like uh, I'm rereading now uh, his essay, which is profound, from 1834, which was suppressed in U.S., where he was suppressed in U.S. Congress. He couldn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Basically, um, Jackson, Jackson in the presidency, they take money that are going into the bank, national bank, and they give that with zero interest to the state banks, who then lends it out with interest. And so that's kind of how they do it. So, but he doesn't just, it's like Lynn, he doesn't just write a practical paper. Okay, here's by point one, two, three, four, this is bad, and here point one, two, three, four, here's what you do. No, no, it's all philosophical. So he has eloquent treatises on Hamilton and credit system and so forth in the way that I couldn't formulate it. It's just really delightful to read. So that's how I would do it, read from him. So, And then if you find there's certain sections uh, of his life you think are exciting or you want to check out what does he think, then you could take those sections from the diary. You can do that. You know, so. Is, the, is that the whole diary is available online now? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is it? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. How many volumes is that? I think it's eleven volumes. Yeah. How many? Eleven. eleven volumes. <laughs> but it is. It is not awful to do. It's really delightful. You know, when you're tired, instead of look and opening for the boob tube, you take the diaries and you just read a little bit and then you're kind of happy inside and you go to bed. That's much better than watching the news that are not news anyway, you know. So that's how you get through it and then you're kind of, you're kind of happy every night. Oh, mm, I have my good night story, right? So. All right, so I'll do another one. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh. This, uh, I guess next time you're going to talk about, because I was just thinking, like, it's so incredible that you had, uh, well, Monroe must have been fairly good also, and uh, him one term, that you had three good presidencies, and then why was it impossible for him to get reelected? That must be, be very interesting how he was defeated in his reelection. It is, it, it is money, and the Souths were really organized with yeah. the support of the British uh, to uh, make sure that, well, this is what we have until today. Yeah. I mean, so um, we were not supposed to uh, be a nation based upon the enabled rights of man, you know? 
So, mm -hmm. all right. Okay. Okay. <laughs>